Hey guys, what we have here is the very, very first print that's ever been done on a Riprap Helios. And if you don't know what a Riprap Helios is, you're probably in the majority because this is the first one ever. It's a prototype and uh, the final version won't actually look very much like this. I mean, it'll have an arm and that kind of stuff, but um, it's gonna it's gonna change quite a bit. Just to give you an idea of how much I'm iterating, um, these are just some of the reject parts that I have here. Um, I thought I should answer a few questions, uh, people, things that people would normally ask in the comment section. So um, let's just jump right to it. Uh, probably the probably number one question would be, what's the build volume or build area? So um, I have this um, printer right here, which has a 20 or 200 by 200 millimeter bed, which is about average size. And um, if you buy a 3D printer that's in the mid range, that's about what you're gonna get. This one right here has a print volume of five times that. And you could actually build, um, if you're just, if you, if you constrict yourself to only square platforms, you can fit at least three of those platforms um, on this, uh, around this printer. So super big build volume. And I know some of you guys are going to question like how fast can it go and that kind of stuff. And just remember that this is the very, very first print. Um, I had some design, I had, I kind of printed as I went, you know, trying to figure out what works and what doesn't. And these arms you can see are adjustable. All those holes, um, if depending on which ones you pick, I can adjust uh, the arm length by like half millimeters. Um, in the final, uh, the final version, it's going to be a static arm length, so that'll be more rigid, and the top arm will be connected to the bottom arm. Um, same thing here. This one's actually the most floppy arm, and so that's going to um, that's going to get tied together. And one thing you can't really tell is the uh, this top this top um, pulley here drives the top arm, but doesn't drive the ball ar bottom arm. And it's free, just freewheeling, and so this bottom corner right here, if I push it, it's quite uh, squishy, uh, but the top one's very rigid. So uh, you can imagine a pylon going between the two, between those two gears and uh, between those two pulleys, and that should really make this a lot more rigid. All right, so speed, I think speed's gonna be fine. Um, one thing that's actually limiting me is that this thing is too light. Um, I mean, people are gonna say that, oh, that's a massive arm. Look at all that size and, um, if, I mean, if you guys have been printing plastic and you know about infill and that kind of stuff, like, you know, these, these are very lightweight objects. Um, all the weights on the outside shell. Um, actually, uh, a little side note. I have a student that made this amazing infill. And um, this is just a, a section of a sphere that was printed and it uses a cubic subdivision infill that's in Cura 2.4 and on. And um, what it does is it um, puts all the density at the outside where you need it and hardly any in the middle, just like, you know, bones and stuff like that. So all these parts are printed with this type of infill, which saves, I would say on average, at least 20 to 30% on plastic usage. Um, but gets you almost the strength as if it was that density throughout. So anyways, side note. <coughs> so um, anyways, the arm's super light and why is that bad is that this arm has a pretty high frequency for the natural frequency, uh, high natural frequency. So um, I don't know if I can, uh, you can see in the video, but um, as it moves around, you can kind of probably perceive just a little bit of jittering as it's hitting those natural frequencies. So if I add, more mass to the end, I'll actually be able to move faster and those frequencies will be dropped. And uh, those amplitudes of those frequencies will also be dropped a little bit. So um, I'll have to play a little bit with mass damping and that kind of stuff. Um, but it's for, for what it is, um, the print quality, that's kind of hard to zoom in or, or focus on that, but the print quality is, is good. It's good. Um, it's it's better than some printers I have, and worse than others. Uh, there's definitely some some bands around it every once in a while, every every so often. Um, nothing's but uh, nothing super bad. But remember, this is the very 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 first print ever that it's done, and this is a prototype that is going to have see some improvements on different design elements. 
and um, so we can't get too caught up on the the surface quality. And to be honest with you, um, I'm not a I'm not a surface quality Nazi. Um, all I really want is a functional mechanical part that's accurate, and this is gonna do it. Um, I don't really need to do any extra work to get it better than this, but it's just by virtue of keep on iterating on this, it's gonna get better. So for me, it's good, and for people that are out there that are interested in surface quality, this is gonna be able to do it too, but um, I'll leave it to you guys to, uh, to you know tweak the settings and, and get all of that right. Um, this is the first time ever that I've used, uh, I don't know if you guys can see it, but this is, uh, uh, I, I believe David Crocker came up with this, the, um, the IR uh, sensor. It has these two, um, two emitters, or, or two sensors in an IR emitter, emitter and, it, and it, it sends out a modulated IR pulse from each, and it tries to sense... I'm not saying this right, but it tries to sense whenever you get an, it, 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 it sees an equal amount from each, and so you can use that for Z probing. <clears throat> Pretty much ignore all of that explanation. Anyway, you can Z probe with that, and it's it is very accurate. And this thing, the first time I've ever used a Z probe, and I got a perfect, beautiful first layer height. I can't I can't ask for a better first layer. And uh, what's not implemented right now and is going to be implemented is that I'm going to, um, in machine coordinates, I'm going to do touch probes along the whole crescent build area that goes all the way around this, you know. Um, so this can, this can sweep and print in this big crescent area. It can actually print a little bit behind it, but you're going to normally clamp it to a table, so that's not really available to you most of the time. So... Um, Somehow you're going to have to be able to print on this unknown surface that you just brought this printer somewhere and you laid it down on a table. There might even be like nicks and like bumps and waves. And so um, this is going to do uh, mesh leveling on the whole build area before it does a print eventually. Or I might like have it specialized to whenever I, I know I'm going to print in a certain area. I'll have different levels of bed leveling. So if I'm going to do a super big print, I can do like the whole build uh, area. But if I'm just going to do something like this, just one probe was actually good enough. Or if it was going to be like a 150 by 150 print, maybe a, a just, you know, just uh, on a little area that's right out here in front. So uh, I'll probably have like three different schemes going on depending on what my needs are. Um, um, but... Let's see, what's other, what are some other features? Oh, um, I do have a, a smoothieware capable board in here. The specific one is an Azteg, Azteg uh, X5 Mini. And uh, it's the first version. I bought it a long time ago. It's been sitting on my shelf for like a two, three years. I don't know. And then I just picked it up and threw it on there. Uh, one negative about this particular board is it has some old um, Texas Instrument drivers. I can't remember the exact uh, uh, style. And um, those are kind of those have kind of fallen out of favor. And based on the specific specifics about how the whole board set up and you know the fast decay rate or different random technical details um, there's some wine and it's not as smooth a motion as is as it's possible so um, whenever I've had a setup where it wasn't quite as it as as geared down as it is um, you can definitely see like you can feel like stutters from the the motion of the um, motion of the printer so this the ability to make the surface quality improve yet again is 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 in just in the choice of picking the right controller. <clears throat> I have just E3D products. Shout out to them. They make amazing stuff. I have a Titan pusher and a E3D light uh, hot end. Um, those have just worked. <laughs> I mean, so I used to like print these things out and then whenever I was doing my first print, you know, I was, I was trying to debug a printer, you know, it was, is the printer wrong or is it my, uh, my pusher or my hot end? And well, I didn't never print, print a hot end, but, um, anyways, having this whole tool chain that I just know works makes, makes this a whole lot easier. <clears throat> All right. Um, let's see how much does this cost? Um, this cost on the order of four to six hundred dollars. I don't know exactly. Um, I mean, if you guys want to price it out real quick, um, you have to have four steppers. <laughs> you have to buy really cheap rails right here. You have to buy a hot end, a pusher, 
and you have to buy a controller board and you have to buy an LCD panel. Well, you don't have to have that, but that's it. That's that's a, that's any 3D printer. <laughs> so um, these belts are cost hardly anything. Um, and they're all the same size, so it's really easy to, to source them. They're all 500 millimeters in circumference. Um, I mean, yeah, there's there's not much to it. Um, there's one, like, there's two exotic uh, bolts. You know, there's one right here that's like 200 millimeters long and one right here, which is 120 millimeters long or something like that. It's not, uh, but those, those were very reasonable from McMaster Car. So, super cheap. Everything else is printed. Um, so, uh, let me um, go through des the design changes that I'm, I'm considering. Um, the the first ones, you know, it make all these integrated. Uh, I have all these shields where you can't see what's going on. That's going to kind of come out into the open a little bit more. You're not going to have... You're going to be able to see what's going on there to save some plastic. Uh, the same thing here. Uh, this... That, right, that belt right here is actually driven by a pulley that comes from this middle one. And... Um, I don't actually need to do all that fanciness, so I'm going to be able to simple fly all these and slim this up a little bit. So whenever I slim all these uh, pulleys up a little bit, I'll be able to maybe slim these steppers up, just get slimmer ones, and um, all of this can shrink down uh, quite a bit. And then that leaves me with this thing that I can't really change is, like, if I want to print 100 millimeters, then this arm has to be 100 millimeters off the table so a print can fit underneath it which means that this case has to be fairly big. And so um, I, need to, I need to fix that. So what I'm going, to, I'm going to do is I'm probably going to make it half height and then have something that folds out and, and clamp to the table. Um, something just big enough to fit the electronics and no bigger. Uh, I, don't, I, want to, uh, I want to get this a much, much smaller because I want this to fit in my backpack. Uh, <laughs> Right now, if I fold it up, which I can't do while it's printing, if I fold it up, it can fit in a 10 by 10 by 10 cube, which is a win, but I think we can do a lot, lot better. Um, another design change is right now you can see that these steppers are, are, are at a 45, or they're 90 degrees to each other, but they're touch, touching on their edge. Um, I'm going to rotate these where they're just face on face, and they're a, a lot tighter stack and this these um these central pylon um spacers or whatever we want to call those i'll make that an integrated piece and then i'll probably put the lcd screen right here and it'll be on a swivel so i can like angle it up and you can work with it uh, like a normal human being instead of having to scrunch down and and do it and i'll just take a moment and bask in that wiring glory um <laughs> I mean, if you guys have ever been built 3D printers, um, wiring never works out like this, but this one does. It is as good as wiring can get. And whenever I go to the next one and they go face to face, I'll put the wire faces towards the middle. So you won't even see a wire on this thing. You will just see the steppers and this nice pylon. In fact, right now the uh, the top plate is actually kind of sitting on top of the steppers. I'm going to actually change it around where it actually kind of cups the steppers and goes down, which will save me yet a little bit more height. And so this will this will all kind of look more like uh, just an actual purposeful pillar instead of uh, just the steppers here, which is cool. You'll still see the steppers, um, but um, these things will kind of be like I think I might even go down into the the electronics part a little bit here and, and make a make this cup up into it so anyways we'll we'll just save inch uh, millimeters wherever we can and so I don't have to have the I don't have to have the uh, LCD screen there I can have it up here and I'll be good to go <coughs> so that slims out this oh and one of the biggest changes is I'm going to make these pulleys smaller I think I haven't done the math so I'm gonna do the math and figure out what my actual resolution is, but right now it's more than good enough. And um, I will I will try to, sh I can't focus. Okay, there we go. Um, I will try to slim those, make those smaller. Right now they're 150 millimeters in diameter. I'm gonna go down to at least 100, if not smaller. And um, some of you guys might be wondering if I will lose my ultimate print resolution. And the answer is maybe I can just do that directly and I'll have good enough resolution. Um, but um, if not, I am thinking about doing um, compound um, 
belt drives all the way. So for instance, uh, this one drives from 16 teeth to 235 teeth, and then there are 100 teeth to 100 teeth. So I don't get anything from this, um, this belt right here. It's just transference motion, which is beautiful and allows me to have this exact same kinematics as the Riprap Morgan. Well, not the exact same. The Z's kind of coupled in there with it and it kind of messes up things, but mostly it's the exact same kinematics as the Riprap Morgan. What I'm considering doing is um, I would do something like, you know, uh, 16 teeth to 100 teeth, and then I would do something like 75 teeth to 125 teeth. Anyways, I would just keep on like stepping it as I go uh, uh, down the chain. I, I don't know the exact numbers. And uh, so that way I can I can uh, get the same mechanical advantage, but uh, with smaller smaller gears everywhere. The one trick is driving this first arm. You know, I, I have to, you know, I have to drive, it looks like I have to drive it directly, but what I could actually do is drive an idler, which would drive belts to this uh, shoulder joint and then drive it back. And then if you're a, if you're a kinematics um, person or a math person, you'll know that um, though that design decision to do all of that will make the math pretty fun, <laughs> pretty horrendous, or, or pretty awesome to do depending on your vantage point. Um, so I, I kind of actually look forward to that challenge. Um, now having all of those belts like chained together, people are going to be like, oh, you're going to get lots of backlash and this and that. So um, as long, I don't, I think I'm going to be okay. Right now it's, it's I have pretty long belt chains and it's pr pr producing pretty good quality. Um, and so I think, I, I think, I, I think I'm going to be okay. You know, proof will be in the pudding. Um, but uh, right now I don't have any belt tensioners, if you guys noticed. Um, I I just rely on this being the right length. So in the future, whenever I have this arm, there's the central pylon. I'll actually have uh, idlers coming out of the middle that can pull back on the belt, and so I can I can do fine um, tension adjustments with just a turn of an Allen key. Um, and so I should be able to get all the backlash completely out of this. I can't um, I can't remove the springiness of just having that long of a belt chain, but. I think I think I'll be okay. Um, again, I haven't put a uh, pencil to paper on that, but you know, just as if this is any evidence, I think we're good. And um, oh, there was one other thing I was trying to mention. Um, oh, um, right now the way I tension these 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 drive pulleys is um, kind of an interesting system where the whole pylon can twist and if you guys can see that I have slotted mounts and so you just you just twist it until you get tension and then you tighten it down I'm gonna get rid of that everything's gonna be just like no slotted mount holes um, I will actually have just um, just tensioner pulleys with one screw that can like pull them in onto the belt and so uh, try to make this a lot easier for people to put together and, and to maintain once it's together. So right now the problem with this is um, whenever you tighten those down, the plastic deforms. And so if you ever try to like tension it to a different amount in the future, that's going to be hard. And so, so that's not cool. And if I did, even if it was easy to like tension it to a different place, then you have to take off the bottom plate and get the electronics and get your Allen key up in there and, and tighten on those. So... Um, I'm gonna try to um, get rid of that. So try to make everything as simple and square and, and like as easy as possible. Like like this part right here seems kind of like a weird shape. I'm gonna make it square and simple and like I'm gonna make it look like it it was obvious you should have done it that way. I don't I don't want anything to look like oh that's a super clever trick. I want it to be like why didn't I think about that? Whenever people look at this. Um, I mean, just simple things like putting the rails like in line with the arm, like it seems obvious, right? But it took me a while to think about it. <laughs> like I was going to put the rails like, you know, rotated 90 degrees from where they were until I thought about it enough. And, and I realized this was the way to do it. So um. anyways, there you have it. This is the first print from the Riprap Helios. I think it has a bright future, <laughs> pardon the pun. And uh, I'll, let you, I'll leave you guys there. Uh, I'll just give you a little bit of roll at the end of this film of it just printing. So um, thanks for watching.